yet, if you're not alone in designing your legacy and its well-trodden path, I'd like to welcome Mr. Shapiro to the Design Your Legacy podcast. Welcome. Thanks for inviting me on the show. This is great. It's my pleasure to host you. So would you share a little bit with the listeners about your background personally or professionally to break the ice? Yeah, it's, it's funny. They're kind of intertwined. Um, I've been an entrepreneur my entire career, which is, you know, 25 plus years now. Uh, my last, you know, J-O-B was, uh, was in high school. Uh, and all of my businesses since then to today have all been in the service of fellow entrepreneurs. Um, there's this I- idea that has really formulated over the years for me of entrepreneurial freedom. Um, and it's something that I've found over the years and I've helped others to find as well. And that really comes down to not just, you know, the financial freedom part, sure, but the the ability to choose how you spend your time and what you do with that time, whether it's reinvesting with your business, reconnecting with family, you know, pursuing hobbies, passions, supporting your community, starting new businesses, whatever. You get to choose how you spend that time. And that's something that, that entrepreneurship really can provide. Oh, that's brilliant. So in my research for today's conversation, I uh, did a little due diligence into your prior podcast and your website and so forth. And, and you really harness the power of masterminds. And I think a part of that you'll speak into regarding the wisdom of Napoleon Hill, like you had said, this isn't our first rodeo. Um, But share a little bit about why you decided to invest your business and your time into this niche. Yep. So the idea of masterminds, like you mentioned, uh, really came from Napoleon Hill and his seminal work, Thinking Grow Rich from the 30s. And, you know, here we are like 100 years later, and the idea is still around and actually growing over time. Um, Napoleon Hill's version of it is very much alive today with a few sort of offshoots that, you know, we can't really call masterminds. But in a nutshell, this is where you get together with a small group of like-minded individuals behind closed doors with a common goal. You know, for me, that goal is always, you know, entrepreneurship and business. These are business owners. And you take that time to connect and support each other and help each other uncover those blind spots that you have and celebrate successes and unblock each other where there might be blocks in business. Because like you mentioned, you know, the, uh, the path has been trodden before. There are other entrepreneurs on the same journey as you are. This and is so, our first time. <laughs> right? If you feel stuck, like someone else has been there, they've gotten unstuck, they have a good resource, they have a connection, there's, uh, there's an experience they can lend you that can help you through that challenge. Um, likewise, as entrepreneurs, like it's lonely. So when you have a big win or been big success, like who do you celebrate that with? Who really gets you? And so when you have that community of like-minded individuals, they know what it took for you to get that win and they can truly celebrate you. And, so, and, and relate. Yeah. And relate. Yeah. Yeah. Like sometimes we have a big win, but you talk to others about it who don't, you know, who aren't business owners and they don't appreciate it the same way that they, they see us as that duck floating across the surface of the water on easy street, having no idea about that swirling turmoil, you know, of feet underneath the water just to make that smooth looking duck, you know, move, move across. Yeah, absolutely. I think of, um, and this is probably a token CEO. I don't even know if he's CEO anymore, but I think about Howard Schultz of Starbucks and he made a decision to close all the stores for a week or two to retrain everyone. And uh, when you talk about, uh, yeah, yes, the results were amazing afterwards, but that moment, the shareholders and everyone around him, Wall Street, et cetera, said, what are you thinking? And I'm sure yeah. he was sweating it. Yeah. Moment. Well, there's a book I love, um, uh, Tiny Bets or Small Bets, Um, And they talk about this idea that smaller businesses can make small bets because you're not betting the farm. It's a small business. Whereas as you get to be, you know, a billion dollar business, suddenly, you know, if you're, if you're an HP or a Toyota or one of these big brands, you're not interested in a small idea, right? You're like, if it's not a billion dollar idea, it's not worth talking about. But in the book, there's one story they share about Amazon that I love, which was, you know, Amazon's always trying things, right? They encourage employees to try new things out, experiment. Right. So one of the ideas was, um, you know, and some of these, the good ones are like, you know, one click buy, right? Prime, uh, subscribe and save. All these things that we all take for granted nowadays were just little ideas. But one of them was the idea of having, um, you know, an auction system, much like eBay. So they started up and they were running, competing against, you know, eBay to be an auction marketplace online. And after a year or so, Bezos was like, well, you know, this, uh, they, after all that work, no matter how big they were, they only got, I think it was like 2% market share. eBay just owned that market. And so they decided to shut that down. So shareholders were up in arms, like, you know, someone, someone's head's got to roll, you know, this is terrible. We need to change in leadership. And the response, you know, from, from up top was no, like the only reason we have all these things that have gotten great results is because we believed in these tiny bets and we tried things much like you're saying Schultz did with shutting the stores down for a week to retrain. 
right? Sometimes those hard decisions are not popular, but sometimes those decisions or those small experiments get you to those really big wins. Yeah, absolutely. And I can only imagine that he needed a mastermind that Friday night. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> so let's chat for a moment about what makes a good mastermind. I know that you've talked about that you're selective and curating the individuals that come through, separating yeah. out those that are beginning compared to those that are seasoned, but also understanding the timing, like whether it's once a month or if the group needs to be smaller or bigger and you've learned what's worked over the years. Say more. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's many kinds of mastermind groups and they've been so impactful to me over the decades. Um, I've been parts of groups where, you know, you write a five to six figure check once a year just to hang out with folks for a few days a year. Um, and there's value in those, right? You're hopping on a plane, going somewhere exotic, spending a few days masterminding, and then, you know, go back. Um, and there's value in those, right? I've also been parts of groups where you meet like once a week at a coffee shop or maybe on a phone call for 30, 60, 90 minutes. Um, and there's value in those too. And I've found though that like, there's also cons and downsides to those ends of this perspective. And the sweet spot is really in the middle there. Yeah. So the best format I found that I love that where we see success um, is what we do at the Bay Area Mastermind. And that's where we meet once a month for a full day to really work on the business versus in the business. And to your question about curation, like it does matter who's in the room, right? You want people on a similar journey. So if you've got someone, you know, building a nine figure business, their conversations with someone building a five figure business are vastly different, right? So you want to be, you want those folks to be on this, on that same path. It's also important to me now, you know, every group is different, but in terms of what we look for, we look for lifelong learners. So through our test drive application process, we actually screen for like, what books have been impactful for you? What events do you go to? What groups are you part of, right? Because there's some statistic out there, like for an obscenely high number of Americans, the last book they read was in high school. Oh, isn't that so true? Oh, and isn't that scary, right? Most folks have, you know, bigger TVs than they do bookshelves, right? Like, what does this say, right? So when you find out that folks are actively reading, that there are authors and experts who have been influential and impactful to them, there are events they're going to, these are all signs of lifelong learners who realize education wasn't done when school's over, but they're actively pursuing the sharpening of the sword, the getting better all throughout life. Those are folks that we want to be around, that we want in the room. Um, we also are looking for folks who are open not just to receiving feedback, right, but are open to providing feedback and asking tough questions. So if during a test drive day, someone is just really quiet and is not saying anything all day, even when we try and draw them out of their shell, that's going to be a challenge because they're not going to be asking others those tough questions. And on the flip side, if others are providing feedback or asking tough questions and that's not going well for them, then they're not in that receptive space to continually improve. So we've been really lucky over the years that we've been able to find and curate really great members who are open to giving and receiving feedback, who are lifelong learners, who are building a real business and are seeing success and now want to scale that. An interesting thing happened though, is that um, I would get folks who are much earlier stage, like you were saying, those founders. And what I found is as an earlier stage founder or prospective entrepreneur, right? You're now not sharing what you're doing that's working or not working. You're now more in a space of asking, how do I questions? Mm. Which is great, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we ended up creating a founders group for these earlier stage founders who are asking more of the, how do I questions? That is a, a shorter meeting time. Um, it is more around the, how do I questions? Um, our mastermind members get to actually be mentors in that group if they'd like to be and help out these earlier stage founders. And it's this really cool incubation space for people who have ideas, right. And are looking to start that business. Whereas our, you know, our sort of core mastermind groups are all around existing businesses looking to scale. That's fantastic. I know that you have said, uh, that you like small hinges that swing big doors. And one yeah. of the benefits is there can be a reflection or clarity around core strengths, as well as hidden opportunities when the conversation gets going. So the next question I wanted to bring up, because some people might know about masterminds, but I think other people, they need to know about the benefits or the results because they would be giving their time. Now we know that they need the community, but people are also kind of hesitant sometimes at first to take the jump, the first step. Yeah. So it's funny, you know, people look for different things in a mastermind group. Um, sometimes they're looking for community, right? They just want to be around others who understand them, who get them, right? When, when your friends and your colleagues and family don't understand what it's like. And so we're looking for that community of entrepreneurship. 
Um, a lot of folks come to me because they're feeling stuck. They're feeling the business has plateaued and they're not able to get through that and they're looking to get unblocked and they want some perspective on that. Others know what mastermind groups are and they're looking for a local mastermind group they can be a part of, right? So folks find us for different reasons. And what I find is everyone brings sort of two different things into the room out of three, right? There's uh, what I call your super, there's a the thing you're really good at, the thing you find easy that others wonder how you do so easily. Right, you might be amazing at you know uh, at pay per click advertising. You might be incredible at operations or systems. You might be fantastic at managing. You might be a wonderful visionary. Right, you've got something that you just do really naturally and easily. Right, so everyone brings into the room the things they know that they know. There's this other category, and that's usually why folks find us is they have a question. They're feeling stuck. Right, so they want to know an answer to a question. The thing that's keeping you up at night. So that big burning question is the thing you know you don't know. But when you know you don't know something, you can look online for an answer, right? You can get a book, you can take a course, you can ask your coach or a mentor, you can ask friends, right? You can seek out answers to your questions. And that's often when folks find us, right? So that's the second thing people bring into the room, the thing you know you don't know. But all the opportunity, the benefits, those big aha moments, those pivotal changes, those all come from that much larger, third category. And that's the things that you don't know you didn't know. So how do you find out about what you don't know you don't know? Well, when you surround yourself by le with like-minded individuals who are on a similar path, albeit getting there in different ways, that's when you get value, not during your hot seat, focus on you and your business, but during time, right? This is where others are sharing what's going on in their business, what's working, what's not working, and so on. And you get exposure to ideas and the internal workings of other businesses that you'd never read about or hear about elsewhere. And this is not a one-way presentation, right? This is a conversation. So when someone's sharing the success they're seeing with this new product launch, you get to ask questions, right? So, you know, I, I love sharing about, uh, we had an e-commerce business that was seeing really great success selling online. And we had a brick and mortar retail business who was seeing really great success with, you know, customers walking into a physical store, right? So these are two successful business owners both seeing success with their own methodologies, right? So the e-commerce business owner is talking all about the email list and how every time they send an email out, money comes in. And the brick and mortar business owner is looking across the table and is suddenly is like, well, you know, asking great questions. What are you putting in the emails and what systems are you using to send out email? And, and you know, how do you measure how successful a campaign is? And, and do you mail everyone or do you segment? And like asking all these really good questions and this e-commerce owner gets to openly share all the great resources, right? On the flip side, when we're over in the hot seat of this retail store owner, they're talking about direct mail and how you can buy lists and work with a direct mail house and send out you know, the, those physical dead trees with stamps on them and people receive them in their homes and then they come into your store and they buy stuff. And so this e-commerce owner who's used to doing email, right? And online advertising starts asking questions of how do you find a list? right? And what do you put on a direct mail piece and who ships it out for you and, and how much does it cost and who does the design, right? So two business owners, both seeing success in their own way and growing, are suddenly learning from each other, right? Neither one of them sought that knowledge out initially, but once exposed to it, couldn't unknow it. And now Absolutely. got to learn tremendously and leverage and grow, grow from that. So those are the kinds of you know, things we see. We see business owners launch new products new sales channels, entirely new businesses. We see business owners get unstuck. Like these are the things that happen all the time, not from the question that a business owner had, but just by being exposed behind closed doors to what others are really doing in their business. And I think those are the most important conversations. I call them like the locker room conversations. Cause again, it's, yeah. it might not be uh, uh, maybe at that public seminar or conference. What I mean by that is it's in these uh, moments where there's a trusted space and then people open up and uh, and then they share their their notes. Their, yeah, I mean, we've all been to conferences where you know there might be a Q and A, and you get to line up for the microphone, right? Correct, correct. And, and, and you're in front of a thousand people there. Are you going to ask that like intimate, detailed, challenging question of what's going on in your business and talk real numbers? Yeah, no, not, not environment, no. Correct, but yeah. yeah, around a boardroom table with people who you know and trust. Um, that's a place where you can share what's really going on in your business. You can share a financial challenge, right? A legal challenge, an HR issue, something where you need real insight from people who've been there and done that. The, the questions you aren't going to ask in an online forum or, you know, in a public space for sure.
Yeah. So before I ask about the common mistakes regarding when businesses stall or when they're scaling, I'm just curious out of the, out of the blue, what, what's your superpower? Oh my gosh. So I, for me, I love connecting the dots, right? So um, part of the fun for me as a facilitator is knowing so many of these business owners over, the, over time is, you know, one person is sharing something that's going on in their business and, and I see the connection and the dots with others who've been through something similar and they might not recognize that pattern, but I see those patterns and those dots and can help connect those. Um, I love systems, repeatability, automation, and those are all just a matter of connecting the dots, right? So when facilitating, one of my superpowers is, is you know, creating community and then seeing where those dots are and connecting others, not just yeah, in business, but like in, in life. Yeah, that's so interesting because I, I read recently that uh, when there's an abundance of information, the thing that people need the most right now is the dot connection because oh they gosh. don't have the time to sift through and see the patterns or the trends. Yeah. 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 In, in this day and age, uh, there is an overwhelming amount of information out there. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's funny. There's, um, there's a great book um, by Cialdini. I think it might be called Influence. Yeah, uh, but it's it all about, be yeah, behavioral psychology, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and so this is all around buyers, right? There's also another great book like Why We Buy. And so they, they talk about this really great study. Um, and so some of us sometimes think that more options is good. And so in the experiment they did is they set out a table selling like jam jars, right? You know, your raspberry, strawberry, blueberry. And what they, uh, what they found is, you know, one theory is, well, if we offer buyers more options, then we're opening up to more markets, right? People who like an apricot jam, if we don't have that, we'll never buy from us. So we have to have apricot, right? We also have to have rhubarb. And so, you, you set out, you know, 12 options versus three. And wouldn't you know at the table of three sold a lot more? That is counterintuitive to what many of us think that more is better. The reality is when you have fewer choices, buyers can say yes. A confused mind says no. So make the decision-making process easy. And so when we connect the dots, right, you're helping someone to more easily make a decision. They're not looking for more options. They're looking for a decision. The best, the best options. Yeah. 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 I think especially in the time crunch these days, people are like, give me the bottom line right now. Right. We're not realizing that it took Jeremy Shapiro like 20 or 30 years to get to the bottom line, to be right. the dot connector. Like it, it, which I think is so interesting because people talk about how valuable soft skills are, but that comes from uh, learning the hard way sometimes. Like, okay, well that didn't work. Now I got to go and say, I'm sorry, or that didn't work. And now I got to, you know, look good after I look bad. Yeah. yeah. There's yeah. a great story about this consultant who a manufacturing plant calls him out um, and he goes through and does this whole investigation and, and, and looks through everything. And at the end, he reports back, um, you know, after all, all of his, you know, everything he's looking into, um, you know, he presents the problem along with the invoice, you know, for like, you know, I think the story, it's a hundred thousand dollar invoice and it has like, you know, screw one dollar, you know, um, but the consulting part is the $999,999. Um, you know, the company's looking at this, like, you know, what do you mean? And he's like, yeah, like, look, the, the decades of experience, right. Mm -hmm. Of knowing what to look for and, and what the problem is like the part, the thing, right. Is, you know, is, is a line item expense, right. But the knowledge is that most valuable part. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So to circle back, what causes seasoned business owners to stall? Yeah. So a lot of this comes down to mindset. Um, Interesting. Because I thought you were going to say the marketplace, but keep going. Oh my gosh. The, um, so yes, marketplace can play a role, but where I see folks get stuck again and again and again comes down to mindset, right? We've got all this head trash going on as entrepreneurs. Um, imposter syndrome disproportionately affects us entrepreneurs. Um, and some folks, you know, we've heard like, you know, fake it till you make it, right? Or I hear from entrepreneurs, like if people only knew or you know, this idea of I'm terrible at this, um, but for some reason people keep paying me, right? There's all this like imposter syndrome out there, right? So us entrepreneurs are able to succeed despite that, right? So one of the mindset blocks I see commonly, this is more for your smaller businesses, right? Um, is this idea that uh, no one can do something as well as you can, mm -hmm. that things need to be perfect, um, that if you hire someone, they're going to steal your whole business and, you know, go start competing against you. It's all these sort of like um, uh, scarcity based mindsets. Sure. And control. Um, yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, sometimes these get in the way of creating systems and hiring and entrepreneurial freedom 
and to creating a business that you can sell, all of this is predicated by having systems and people. So if you don't create the systems to get a defined result and you don't bring on the right people to execute that system on your behalf, do you have a business, right? Are you creating a legacy? Are you creating a business you can sell? If it's all dependent on you, not really. Yeah, it's interesting because I think there is an aspect where the knowledge needs to be distilled and uh, formatted in such a way that it can be passed on. Because if not, let me go back to Howard Schultz for a moment. And he did have a successor, but um, then it's like it all dies with Howard Schultz. Yeah. Yeah. And that's unfortunate. But it also means that that entrepreneur has to keep growing. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, you end up creating like, you know, especially for our, you know, first time entrepreneurs leaving the corporate world and starting a business, right? you you want like the best parts of a business. You don't want to take the worst parts of a business and the worst parts of a job by creating a prison for yourself where you've got to be working, you know, 26 hours a day, nine days a week, right? It's not possible. But many business owners go out there with that mindset and then they're stuck in that. And then they're missing the most important parts of life because they feel that that's what they're supposed to do. That's, that's what they should be doing. Yeah. But you can stop shooting on yourself and create a plan right? Well, and you I think can then they, create this, a real business. Yeah. I think your masterminds are pointing to individuals that can be truth agents that can come into a room and have those hard truthful conversations. Yeah. Because again, when you talk about family and friends, they might not want to tell you the hard truths to your face. Right. Well, and they also don't, they don't, know they, they don't know those best practices either. So they might think, oh yeah, that's what you should do. Right. Yeah. There, there's a stat out there. It's like the, the average subway franchisee, you know, works on like 80 hours a week for, by the way, a business they bought into, they paid to get a sandwich shop and they make, it's like, you know, $60,000 a year. Mm. And I'm looking at that, you know, uh, what they're making, what they're putting in and that they paid for that opportunity and they have all the liability and risk of, of owning a small business and everything that goes with that. And they're usually personally guaranteeing all these things. So like, it's the worst of everything, but like, that's not unusual for a small business owner to take on the worst of the worst. Yes. Yes. So before we talk legacy, let me just keep it within the business umbrella for a moment under the business umbrella. Um, funnels, so much of today's uh, commercial transactions happen online. So what have you seen regarding funnels, like what works, what doesn't work, and uh, how can individuals tighten things up if they do have an online yeah. funnel? Well, l let me broaden that for a second. I think when we talk about funnels, we most often think online marketing funnels. But really, like I've got my funnel glasses, like funnels are everywhere, not just your, your sales funnel, your marketing funnel, your hiring funnel, your career ascension and so on. So the same process I apply to marketing funnels online can be applied to any of these funnels. And what I do is I apply, um, there's a model called theory of constraints. Um, um, Elliot Goldratt writes about this in The Goal. If you haven't read The Goal, it's a fantastic book. Um, the whole idea is we look at like, what is the constraint in your system? So if we think about the steps in your funnel, there's going to be one part that's performing the worst. All we do is we look at what's the worst performing part of your funnel. Let's tweak that. And as soon as we do that, we're going to have a new part that is now your worst performing part. And we just iteratively improve that. But in order to apply this very simplistic system, right, we first need to do, you know, a few really important steps that many business owners shockingly don't do, right? Um, and I can say this having talked to a lot of business owners and seeing that they don't do this. So, for our listeners, this probably is you and that's okay. We've all been there before. The first thing you want to do is actually know what your funnel is, right? And that means knowing your funnel steps, right? A common one to your question on online funnels, you're going to have, let's say you're running PPC, you're going to have impressions on your ad. You're then going to have clicks on your ad and this leads people to your page, right? So no matter what, you'll then have views on your website. You then probably have opt-ins. You then might have purchases or scheduling a call or something all the way down to someone making a purchase, buying more and so on, right? These are all funnel steps, right? If you have a coaching business, if you have a consulting, it varies. But the idea is there's, there's a linear process people go through to do business with you. So document those, open up a spreadsheet. I have a free spreadsheet, a, a worksheet. You can put these in that you can copy for yourself, right? Put each of those steps in. That's a great first step. Most business owners don't even do that. Now we know what your funnel steps are. The second step, fill in the numbers, right? Look at your data, know how to get your data for the same time period, right? And track these steps in your funnel, right? So look at how many impressions you got, how many clicks you got, how many opt-ins and all those things, right? Once we're doing that, now we're tracking data. Now the important part is don't mess with your funnel, right? Just consistently track that data. And then we can start to iteratively improve. 
we can look at the conversion rate between each of those steps. So let's say we'll use really simple numbers here. You have a hundred views on your homepage and you get two opt-ins. Two divided by a hundred is 2%. You know your opt-in rate is 2%. Let's say that's the worst performing part of your funnel. Our question is going to be, what can we do to get more of the visitors to your site to opt in? We want to move that two up. So we make some changes to your site, to your offer, to your traffic, whatever it is, and we get that two to say a 5%. That's great, right? We've more than doubled the number of opt-ins you're getting by changing nothing else, right? That's huge. That's game-changing for a business. So by applying this process iteratively, we then look at the next worst performing part and we improve that and so on. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think the the step one, like uh, I think Tony Robbins said one time that 51% of success is just showing up. If somebody can just right. look at their numbers, that's like the first step compared to if someone's dodging them. Yeah. 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 Well, sometimes we don't even know what to look at, right? And I see classically business owners will have different numbers in different places and they're pulling them, but it's not from the same time period. It's not from the same data, right? So you're not looking at a holistic funnel. You're looking at sporadic pieces. And then the other thing I see business owners do is they'll change nine things at once right? Mm. Or they'll have something that's working and then they stop doing that and start doing something else entirely. Well, we can't track if what you change makes a difference if we don't know what the variable is that we changed. So it's a rather scientific approach to what is typically a, you know, spaghetti on a catapult, you know, approach that business owners have, um, where we just change so much so quickly and we don't give things a chance to give us a baseline. Once you have a baseline, you can work to improve off that baseline. And like we were talking earlier about those small bets, not every experiment will work. Sometimes we change something and our conversion at a certain step goes down. That's okay because there's still a valuable lesson to be learned there, right? We can undo that and iteratively improve again. Yeah, I think that what you're saying is really valuable. It means also that that entrepreneur needs to be analytical and not just uh, emotional in managing, I I might call it self-management. Because they're already scared. Oh my gosh, I'm at, and I'm in the marketplace. I'm doing this for the first time, or I'm trying that new thing for the first time. And and you're right. A company like Amazon, they can fall back on their uh, their huge volume because they've got yeah. the momentum behind them. But um, so, smaller entrepreneurs, yeah, sometimes I think they just quote wing it. Well, I, I just had a gut feeling, and, and that's okay, right? And and it's fine to wing it to get to market, right? Yeah, um, I'm a huge believer in MVPs or minimum viable products. One of the reasons being is the sooner we can shorten the, the time from your idea to getting to market, the sooner we can start learning, right? Because until we actually try and sell the darn thing, okay. we don't know if it's going to sell, if the market we thought would like it, if the product will resonate with them, if our messaging is right. It's all theory okay. until we put it into practice. So the sooner we can do that, the sooner we can get a baseline and then we can iterate and incrementally improve. Very cool. Very cool. So since this is a Design Your Legacy podcast, let me bridge the world of masterminds with holistic legacy planning. So when it comes to, let's say, five people that you invite, that you would invite into a room to help you mastermind your legacy design, who gets invited? Ooh, interesting. So um, the story I shared earlier about like the e-commerce and retail store business owner, that's an example of what I call cross-pollination. The cross-pollination of ideas is so huge for me, right? Um, And that comes down to carefully curating diversity in the room, different business models, different business types, and so on, right? So very often I see folks with like decent operations, like once they get a lead, they know how to fulfill and do a good job, but they're looking for for more business, right? Their challenge is like, hey, I want to grow the business. I need more leads. Side note, there's a ton of ways to grow your business without just more leads, right? So I less often see folks that are overwhelmed by leads, but have terrible operations, We do get folks like that from time to time. And I find that like fascinating, right? To see two very opposite problems across the table. Um, So I'd love to balance that out a bit, right? So more folks um, who, you know, are overwhelmed on the lead side, but want help on the operation side. Like that's that's a good person for that room, right? A business owner um, with superpowers in social media, right? Who just is seeing tremendous success there, but not really in other channels. I think that's a really cool person um, that I want to see in the room. A systems ninja is always good. Um, someone who just gets everything documented and, prove, and, and proven out and revised. Um, love more of those. Um, I uh, also love when we see people who are getting results in one sales channel. Okay. 
but they're now plateaued or they seeing that market slip away. Okay. Right. And this sometimes shows up, like you were saying earlier, people who are like, you know, seeing challenge in the market, right? Okay. Because that's really interesting. I love learning from folks who are really successful okay. in that one channel, but are okay. looking for others. Yeah. So let me push you a little bit here on the yeah. spot. So if you had to name names, who would you invite in? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I don't think of it as names. I, I always think of it as like avatars, right? Okay. Sometimes the avatars have a made up name, but it's not, it's not a person. It's not, you know, it's not a, not, not a, a you know, a, a, a wall of faces as it were, right? Okay. Well, I'm going to give you a coaching homework assignment for the next 30 days sure. to find the names that fit into those okay. avatars. Yeah. Fun. Okay. okay. <laughs> I, so I put what, that down. Cool. Cool. Thank you for accepting the challenge. Yeah, um, I love it. So what would, uh, what would you say that legacy means to you personally, the word itself? Because as we talked about in our preamble, this is not the everyday conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So like if we zoom out, like we all have the same destination. We're all going, we're all going to the same place, right? And we don't really have a say in that. Where we do have a say is like what we do between now and when we're no longer. And so like legacy in a word to me is like the impact we leave behind when we're no longer around um, to do that in person. Okay. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you. It's so interesting that uh, what I've learned over the years is there is the uh, definition in the dictionary. And, and I've also looked at the etymology, but whenever yeah. I ask an individual one-on-one, -on -one, that man or woman always has a unique answer, personal to themselves. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, it, it's funny because like when I talk to entrepreneurs, right? So many are just in that shorter window focus of like, I got to build the business. But when we zoom out again, looking longer term, businesses only go one of three directions, right? One to legacy is you pass this on to your kids. Mm. It's a multi-generational business, mm -hmm. which like, look, does that happen? Sure. But it's rare, right? It's really rare. We have a true multi-generational business. The fact is most of us don't want to pass it on to the kids. And the reality is if you do, most of the kids don't want it. So the idea of leaving the business as a legacy rarely, rarely happens. It does, but it's rare. The second direction is where most businesses go is that it just gets run for a period of time. And then, you know, you close up shop and that's that. You ride the way and we think about, Yeah. 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 So when you think about our baby, the thing we created, we've, we've invested so much time that we gave up everything for to think about it, just going out of business. Like no one wants to think about that, which leaves our option, which is you sell the business. So when we look at it longer term that, oh, we're actually creating a cash flow income producing asset that we're going to sell. Well, then that changes everything that all the, all the things line up for that path because we're no longer looking to build a business that we just run forever. Yeah. Insightful. In one to two sentences, what would you like your holistic legacy to be? I'll give you the one to two sentences with one little preamble. Is okay. that fair? Yes. Okay. Um, so I've always been a huge advocate for like entrepreneurial freedom, right? And a longtime champion of like the anti-hustle movement, like the whole like working 90 hours a week at the expense of family relationships and all okay. is like a losing trend, right? Okay. So that being said, you know, uh, my legacy it's not going to be like my brand or my business or any of that, but it'll be through the lives that I've impacted through my presence, right? The people I've inspired to go on that path, the lives of my family, community, clients, readers, impact partners, and beyond. Oh, that's a nice answer. Thank you. And that's deeper than, uh, yeah. And you're absolutely right. I, I think that legacy, uh, a lot of times people think about it in terms of financial terms or it's their business, but it has to be something a little bit, uh, more profound like that, more profound yeah. than that. Like you had said, you know, how did you touch lives? And even just this idea, if I slow down for a moment of your presence, the yeah. fact that you live, the, the fact that you showed up into that room. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. What would you say are three or four core values or guiding principles? That Oh, I, I love this. There, okay. You know, I, for, for our listeners, we've all heard about core values. They're so important, right? Well, I think this um, is the Northern star and they get lost sometimes through the pressures in life. Please go ahead. Yeah. Well, like we've all heard of them. Like, okay, good. Um, you know, and speakers from stage and books will tell you like, this is why it's so important, but like no one ever wants to talk about like, what is the process to go through? And like, I, I'm also a tactical guy. Like, you know, you gave me an assignment. I'm like, I put it down, I'll get it done. Right. I, I want the direction. Um, and no one wanted to talk about that. So finally, years ago, um, I came across a book traction by Gino Wickman. That was the first book that actually wanted to get into the nitty gritty of it and said, here's the process, here's what to go through. And, he, and, and, the, and the output of this process is core values. Um, so I'm willing to give it a try. 
Um, so I was on a, a call with my team and I was like, all right, guys, like I, I bought everyone a copy of the book. Go read this. We're going to talk about this at a meeting next week. Um, here's some reading to do before then. And uh, everyone got that. And then we went on to like the regular you know, business of our meeting. And in the conversation, we were talking about something that a customer was looking for. Um, and what I said is like, yeah, we could do it this way. Like, sure, we could solve that one need, but to take care of more of our customers, like what if we, we took a bigger approach? It's, it's going to be more work to get there, but like it's the right thing. And there was a pause and one of my team members said, well, Jeremy, I, I think we've got our first, first core value there. And like they hadn't even opened the book yet. And like already just by sending the idea, we're going to do this, they were surfacing this core value of like, when we do something, we do it right. Mm -hmm. so, um, so zooming out, like the book Traction was so great at giving us a process to go through to figure out core values. And I love that. So when I look at some of the values that, you know, guide, guide me personally or guide my companies. Or even um, will guide your legacy planning. Keep yeah, going. and guide the legacy. Um, one of them is like family matters. Like we value family. Mm -hmm. That's, and whether it's your, you know, the, your biological family, your adopted family, your, your customers, your employees, your team, whatever it is, like the people are important. Your right? tribe, your pack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so family matters. Um, one that I was just sharing from that story that came up, uh, which was so true, um, is when we do something, do it right, right? We don't, we don't we half energy it. We don't take care of just the short term. We take care of that longer term need too. Yep, um, there, let's just stand up for a second. There's an expression, when do we have time to do it right the second time? Ah. Uh, Oh, right. Like let's do it right the first time. Yeah. Um, and that's related to, but vastly different from the idea of we do the right thing. Right. Mm -hmm. um, which sometimes that might be costly, right? Sometimes that might be difficult. Sometimes it might be the harder path, mm -hmm. but we do the right thing. Right. Um, and that is not always the easy choice, but that is, uh, that, that's really huge. Uh, it's something that we talk to our kids about all the time. It's something we talk as a team about all the time. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's important. Um, and you said, uh, you said a few, so I, I'll leave you with this last one, which is we have fun. Um, mm. if, if, if we don't love what we're doing in work in life, whatever else, then we've got to ask like why we're doing it. Um, and what, what I think is interesting is sometimes people think hard is not fun. Um, you know, I'm uh, I'm a competitive endurance athlete. I spend a lot of time, you know, outdoors, um, and I often do really hard things. Um, and it's not for misery, right? Hard things can be fun. Doing the right thing can be fun, right? Being with family can be fun. So find the fun of that. Yeah, I was going to bring up uh, when, when I read your bio. It talked about climbing mountains and cycling unreasonably long distances for fun, <laughs> running, etc. And I thought, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, you're pushing yourself. I would add one of your life, uh, one of your values would be being a lifelong learner. Yeah. Well, so you asked me for a few of them, right? Yeah. Uh, but one of them is also Kaizen. Um, this idea of uh, continuous, never ending improvement. Th that's uh, Japanese word. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, and so Kaizen is really important. Um, so it's, it's understanding that uh, nothing, nothing is done or perfect, right? When we create systems for a business, they're always editable documents. They'll be revised. Even core values, we think we've got it figured out and dialed in. You know, in 10 years, you might realize something else has surfaced that's also important. Nothing is written in stone, so including ourselves. Be open to feedback. Be open to realizing we can be better. Be open to getting homework assignments, right? Be a lifelong learner. Very nice. I hope your children can watch this video one day. <laughs> you know, they, uh, they, they, um, they occasionally see some of this stuff and they'll ask me like, you know, Dad, are, are you famous? I'm like, I don't know. Like, is that, that's not what I'm after. <laughs> Um, so yeah, they, they, they see me in a video like these and they, and they think, you know, gee, I'm, I'm on be something, right? Yeah. Well, it's interesting when somebody sees someone on the, the screen, whether that's the television, the telly or YouTube. Yeah. 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 Um, let's say you were to set aside a weekend or two a month to design out your personal legacy hardcover coffee table book. What images, stories, et cetera, would fill its pages? Oh my gosh. I do this. Um, but not as a, not as a, as a coffee table book. That's a fun idea, but that's uh, that gets to a little more being in stone versus being this uh, Kaizen, right? Um, no. So, you know, when I, when I look at what I do put together, um, it's photos of family, friends, community clients, um, it's pictures of epic adventures. Okay. Um, when I look back at all the, the ridiculous things I've said yes to over the years, um, all the things that most people would find a million reasons to say no to that I find a million and one reasons to say yes to, those are the most, you know, incredible life memories. Um, you know, 
it's uh, it's, it's all the best things in life have come from saying yes to ridiculous things for me. Great. Um, great. Nice. What's the best epic adventure? Oh my gosh. There's, uh, f from, uh, uh, mountains to sailing adventures to, uh, to, um, uh, you know, com competitive cycling event. There's, there's so many, um, but yeah, yeah you know, sure. Good. I'll share one with you. Um, years ago we had friends who, uh, who had little kids at the time, um, they had, I think, a three and a five year old, and we had like a, a one and a four year old. Um, and they said, "Hey, like we were, we were thinking of doing um, this sailing adventure around the Mediterranean, um, you know, getting a, a huge catamaran um, and doing that with, with with one other family. But like, we don't know who would ever say yes to that. But you know, what would your interest be? And I, you know, without missing beat, I'm like, oh my gosh, that sounds incredible. Um, we don't know how to sail. Is that a problem? Uh, so you know, we had like." Lord. <laughs> right. Um, you know, and my wife is looking at our, you know, newborn at the time thinking, well, you know, is he going to be walking by then? Um, you know, what do we do at sea, you know, with the new walker? How will this be? So short, short story, we went out and learned to sail and, uh, you know, we all sharpened our skills and put in the time um, and, you know, took out, uh, you know, a catamaran out of the Mediterranean. Um, for quite a long time on our own and had just an incredible trip of a lifetime, mm. um, you know, and it, from that to, you know, uh, you know um, riding bikes from San Francisco down to LA or, you know, across Nevada and back in a competitive event, you know, at desert, desert altitude um, with tens of thousands of feet in elevation gain, you know, over 500 miles um, and racing that on fixed gear bikes just to make it, you know, more difficult and fun. Uh, you know, life is filled with all sorts of, you know, great fun adventures like that. Oh, that's wonderful. That's a good yeah. life. That's a good yeah, life. Yeah, I think so. Any think closing so. thoughts on the subject of legacy or a call to action to the listeners or viewers? Um, well, this kind of ties to your, to your last question about like that coffee table book and, and, and this question, but, um, you know, be intentional with how we spend our limited time we have here on this earth, right? No one's ever been on their deathbed and their dying breath said, gee, I wish I put more time into my business or... You know, I, I, I wish I, I worked harder. Like that's never anyone's last thoughts. So yes, work hard, right? Yes, you know, start businesses and do those things. But like be intentional with how you spend that time. Very um, nice. Very nice. Yeah, it's, it's never too late to have your business support your legacy, but you don't need to do it alone. Bravo, bravo. And a good website. Um, yeah, so you can uh, find uh, find all kinds of stuff like we're talking about uh, on our call today um, at bayareamastermind.com. Um, I love writing about this, interviewing folks who, uh, who've been there and done that, um, sharing how to start mastermind groups, how to find mastermind groups, all those kinds of things. And everything's at bayareamastermind.com. Lovely. Um, I just wanted to take a moment, uh, Jeremy, to thank you for being a guest on today's uh, podcast episode. Thanks for inviting uh, me on. I've had a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. I thought you brought up some really great points about uh, being a lifelong learner, the value of community, also the value of presence that sometimes just showing up makes a huge difference. So thank you very much. Thank you. In closing, I'm Angelina Carlton, the hostess of the Design Your Legacy podcast, as well as the founder of Legacy Planning, a boutique advisory firm based out of Beverly Hills, California, USA, but international in those I coach. I hope to dive deep into subjects that can help a person define, develop, and execute their legacy and continue to scour the landscape for those who can be great resources to every dimension of your legacy. For many listeners, there can never be enough education and preparation in the mood or moat around your castle. Whether you find yourself with new wealth or generational wealth, may the content on this channel be an anchor in any storms ahead. We do our best to provide original content for your intellectual and emotional curiosity. Thank you so much for joining us today. Check us out on SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc. Remember to leave a review, a rating. Uh, send an email to either Jeremy or myself, share your thoughts about today's conversation. So thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Jeremy, for speaking into your legacy.